So uh, I'm Tan Zhao from Amidia um, to host this talk today. I'm glad to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Hogger Rose, which is also my colleague. Dr. Hogger Rose is a senior applied research scientist at NVIDIA, focusing on deep learning for medical imaging. He has been working closely with clinicians and academics over the past several years to develop deep learning based medical image computing and computer aided detection models for radiological applications. He's an associate editor for IEEE TMI and holds a PhD from University College London, UK. In 2018, he was awarded the Mikai Young Scientist Publication Impact Award. And today, his talk will be about the techniques for collaborative development of AI models in the age of COVID. Hager? Thank you very much, Sam, for the kind introduction. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, yeah, so exactly. So I, I'd like to talk about some techniques that we uh, worked on to develop um, AI models for COVID image analysis. And um, I would like to start to introduce some of the background here. So for COVID-19 diagnosis, um, what role can me medical imaging play? Um, by now, I think uh, everyone knows that this, the gold standard test to test for um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection is via the PCR test, but um, medical imaging can play an important role um, to provide further in information about um, the current disease status, for example, or patient management um, and triaging of patients in the hospital system. So um, especially chest CT is a very rich information that we can, um, from chest C CT, we can get very rich information about the infiltration of the, the, the uh, lung disease uh, or, or COVID. Um, based uh, pneumonia by looking at these opacity region, regions in the in the lung scan. So you can see uh, different severity um, of the of the disease for different patients. And uh, motivated by this, we we um, actually joined with the NIH, uh, a radiology group led by Brad Wood. Um, to, to build a, a multinational data set, uh, including more than 3,000 images from China, Japan, Italy, and the US. So the, these were all acquired very early on in the, when the pandemic started. Um, the uh, NIH experts uh, annotated these uh, cases, and we, like with a uh, a uh, so strong effort from both teams, we uh, or multiple teams involved here. Of course, we uh, developed these models um, for um, lung segmentation and uh, subsequent classification of the COVID pneumonia versus pneumonia or diseases caused by, uh, uh, caused by other um, issues. And um, the models were also released. It was resulted in a nature communications paper where we reported um, over 90% accuracy um, on different, differentiating different types of um, COVID uh, associated pneumonia and non-COVID related pneumonias um, across this diverse set of uh, uh, patients from different countries. And our pipeline is relatively straightforward. So we take the the CT scan, we first developed a robust uh, lung segmentation model that um, can be used then to find a region of interest, kind of crop the 3D volume to uh, get uh, only the lung region. And uh, we actually um, then used uh, different schemas to uh, predict COVID-19 versus non-COVID-19 based uh, diseases. And uh, like a like a, a full 3D classification model or hybrid approaches that would kind of slice through the volume uh, and cl classify several sizes. Um, 
you can see they all perform very, very good for um, for this task. So we we kind of concluded that th these these models are very powerful to for this task, and um, they can be usefully integrated into clinical workflows. Uh, those models were then released. We made the data uh, also available. So part of, part of this data set was uh, publicly released is now in the Cancer Imaging Archive. And the lung segmentation and COVID classification models are available on our NGC uh, NVIDIA GPU Cloud uh, website. Here you can see some of the like saliency maps that we can uh, generate from uh, things like um, uh, cam based approaches um, to to uh, highlight which regions in the image caused um, the classification res result, and uh, they seem to be quite reasonable for for these for this application. Uh, furthermore, we published a, a deploy pipeline that is uh, basically using our our released models. And uh, it this could be uh, integrated into a, a clinical pack system where the the the, the Clara deploy um, reads directly the DICOM images, applies the lung segmentation model, and then uh, the result uh, is being fed to the the chest classification model um, to do the classification, and the re result will be written back to a DICOM writer, so it's available. To the radiologist in the, in the PAC system. Um, from from the kind of the, from the same collaboration, we um, we um, moved on towards also segmenting the lung, uh, the COVID lesions in the lung uh, uh, directly. Um, here again, this was uh, kind of built on the same data set as for the classification task. Um, but the radiologists actually put a lot of effort into hand annotating these different regions in the in the in the lung, so we could then develop models that segment the, the lung and really measure the kind of disease burden by maybe computing the the ratio between uh, inf uh, infected lung versus the entire lung volume, um, which is typically a good quantitative um, biomarker to uh, judge the disease spread or the state of the disease. And this is then really what also led us to develop a, a challenge or set up this challenge together with Children's National uh, and the NIH um, on COVID lung uh, C, uh, CT lesion segmentation. This was uh, um, started in 2020, uh, we had uh, yeah, we had uh, 98 test submissions from 29 countries across six continents. So uh, really, there's a as you can imagine, there's a lot of interest in COVID-19 from all over the globe. Um, strong participation from China, and uh, the, the the models were then. Um, after developing the, like we had like uh, two phases, one is the training phase and then the uh, uh, testing phase. And after um, on the testing, we, we provided two different data sources, um, one from the same cohort as was used in, uh, in training. So this was kind of our, our scene data set. Um, so the uh, basically the same same data source, right? Which are different cases, but from the same source uh, that was used. Uh, what the uh, participants used to develop their um, algorithms, and we have another data set from a rural population in uh, the U.S., which we used as the unseen data set. We used a statistical ranking uh, toolkit. To, um, to evaluate all these different algorithms. Here we, we see the, the top um, performing algorithms uh, evaluated on, on these uh, uh, different metrics across the different tasks. 
Uh, you can see things like the dice coefficient, normalized absolute volume difference, which the volume prediction is important for this clinical task, and also surface dice um, error at uh, one millimeter. And uh, the ranking stability of different algorithms is uh, shown here. So you can see 53 and 38 are kind of the best performing algorithms across the, these different tasks. And then uh, here we, we see the, the final ranking. Um, the, the team, uh, like one observation here is that people use uh, mostly directly 3D models, but some combinations were also successful. And uh, NNUNet has been uh, shown to be very effective across the board um, for, for these type of challenges. So here we have uh, mostly uh, unit-based approaches, but with the, with the NNUNet um, training re re regime. Um, and then what seems to, uh, oh, many also used ensembles. Um, Pre-training was actually less of a use, I guess, because there are no, no generalizable 3D pre-trained models um, uh, currently available. But what, what gave the winning algorithm the edge was uh, using extra data in a uh, unlabeled extra data, actually, in a, in a semi-supervised learning way. So I think that uh, was probably the, the key ingredient here to, to um, achieve more robustness. And we, we can see this uh, here. So um, a trip, and on, on a typical scene case, uh, these two algorithms perform quite similar. There are some, some regions where both algorithms are missing that, but you know we, we also have some uh, inter-observer discrepancies, of course, in the data set. So it's uh, kind of hard to say uh, what is like the real uh, truth in these cases. Um, but here we, we actually see a typical um, challenging unseen case where both algorithms actually make a false positive prediction on a, on a blood vessel, but they're missing the real region. And then here's an example where this, uh, the winning algorithm showed a better robustness on the unseen case where basically all other algorithms miss this, this, this lesion, but uh, the winning algorithm got it. Okay, so in the, in the next part of my presentation, I, I really want to talk more about this kind of how can we actually improve the robustness we saw in the challenge that um, the algorithm worked well on the, on the scene data set, the scene test, uh, uh, on the test set from from the scene data source, but um, they actually mar worked markedly um, less well on the on the unseen data set source. So, in order to increase generalizability of um, AI models, we we really need to make use of vast amounts of diverse training sets. And that comes with challenges, right? In, in, in healthcare, we cannot easily share um, data across hospital, uh, hospital sites uh, and then even across countries. Uh, um, it's, it's very challenging to, to um, regulations and the, uh, patient privacy concerns. So one solution is to use federated learning where we keep um, data on site, like every hospital contain uh, remains the data owner then they never need to share the raw data with anyone else but we share models by moving them around between different hospital sites and learning from each other um in Cla uh, yeah in nvidia clara which is uh, our sdk to uh, perform um, training for deep learning and medical imaging we developed a, a federated learning uh, solution based on the um, server-centric model, where we have a, we have a central server with, that initializes the training, kind of provides a, a initial global model. That global uh, model is then distributed to different hospitals. 
they train on their local data and send back weight updates and uh, you know to update a global model. The updated model is sent back and uh, this process is iterated until uh, convergence. So as I said, data stays on site. Uh, we have the, the server sending the global model and then uh, at each round of tra um, training, um, a, a model weight update is being sent back to the server and aggregated in some some way, typically in a weighted aggregation. And uh, it, it, there, um, of course, there's still still con uh, theoretical concerns about uh, what what kind of information do these weight updates actually contain? Do they leak any information about the training data? So we we do have options to add additional privacy preservation techniques like uh, differential privacy or encryption before sending any information out of the, of the client side or the, the hospital side. If you're interested, um, we wrote a paper that goes into all the potential impacts and benefits for, uh, uh, of federated learning for different stakeholders from clinicians to um, manufacturers. Um, yeah, we really think that, you know, federated learning is basically a, a very practical tool that's important to uh, scale up AI model development by making it practical that you can learn from very large and diverse data sets. Then um, one, one um, piece of work that we worked, uh, that we uh, developed is uh, to do, do semi-supervised learning in this federated learning setting. Um, you can see that um, some clients might have data, but it's not annotated. And um, by, by still providing their data in an in a unlabeled way, we can learn uh, using self-supervised -super learning techniques from the data and it, it benefits um, the global model. Um, another question is that, as I said, typically people use like a weighted aggregation on the server to update a model based on the, the model updates from each client. Um, these weights are typically based on a heuristic um, relating to the local data set size. So you weight hospitals that have more data and trained longer in the current round, you give them a higher weight. Um, but uh, that of you, of you can imagine that it might not be um, optimal, like more data doesn't necessarily mean that the, uh, the information coming from that side is the uh, most relevant or most important. So here we investigate a data driven approach where we can during the training, uh, the federated learning training, you know, at each round, we can actually also learn the, the optimal um, aggregation weights based on the on the on the local data sets. And then, if you see, if you compare this to the the standard federated averaging, which is just this weighted aggregation I talked about, uh, we can see that we get more robust, uh, or better performing models. Here are less out, um, outliers, and here it's a, it's a it's a more accurate segmentation of the of the COVID lesion. Okay, so then with this federated learning kind of becoming a reality, we um, really wanted to test it on a large scale in the real world. So um, in the in this uh, large study, you can see. Many authors on this one, we had 20 collabor uh, sites collaborating uh, to get us um, this federated learning study off the ground. And it was published um, a couple of months ago in Nature Medicine. And here, to do this in the real world, right, you have to make sure that um, all uh, different, like that it's easy and it's also secure. To, to, de uh, to deploy this FL system. And it, it needs to be productive in, in the sense that we can iterate through the, the model development process easily. So we've been running this for like two or three weeks, the system. It was easy to set up, like each 
client would get a, a startup kit uh, with like the secure um, SSL certificates so that we could ensure that only authorized clients connected to the server uh, or the communication channels were uh, SSL encrypted to make sure that there's no tampering with those in, uh, information flow. And the researcher um, in the, uh, was able to iterate through many uh, pros, uh, different experiments by using a, a admin console. As I said, we had 20 different sites and the, the goal actually was to predict uh, the oxygen oxygen needs uh, a patient would require when uh, um, arriving at a emergency department with symptoms of uh, COVID-19. So we predicted both uh, the different oxygen needs in, in, a, in a 24 hour and 72 hour period after arriving in the ER. Uh, based on a chest x-ray and uh, a set of EHR data, so like standard blood levels uh, and uh, these uh, tests, some uh, some patient uh, information like patient age uh, was used as input to the model. So here we can see the global distribution of the different hospital sites. Also, we had a, like a very uh, a varied amount of data, um, um, different sites, that, you know, depending on the stage of the ban pandemic, basically, they would have more or less uh, patients uh, with symptomatic, um, with symptoms of COVID arriving in the ER. So based on that, we had like different data set sizes. Also, here we plot the intensity profiles or like histograms of the chest x-ray across different sites. So you can see that based on patient population, imaging acquisition protocols and uh, scanner types, we, we, we do see a, quite a, a varied amount of uh, variation here. And uh, also here patient age, you can, you can see that it, it's typically, you know, the uh, a middle-aged uh, population, but we also had a, a pediatric hospital site where you had a lot of younger uh, patients. So the main result is actually uh, that federated learning really benefited the, tra the model training. Um, in av on average, we had a 16% improvement compared to any model that was trained just on local data uh, for a particular site. So here, this is, this is ordered by size. Um, so site one would uh, have the largest data set. So you can see that even they get a good performing local model, but the, 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 uh, the federated learned model gives even them uh, improvement. Um, and that's, that's across the board. And then the, the really big improvement comes on the generalizability. So here we, we tested these locally trained models just on the, own, the hospital's own data. Again, here you can see it based on size ordering. And uh, while hospitals with like a large amount of data, they can achieve models that also work well on test data from the other hospitals. So that's um, how we measure the generalizability. But uh, a big impact was performed uh, was uh, we got a big impact by using the federated learning to get a, the most generalizable model across the across the board. Um, here again, some some different thresholds for these different uh, oxygen needs um, evaluated on a on a smaller data set in Asia, and uh, in the, the the gray bars we can see the performance of five of five different models trained on local data from a, a, a larger hospital in the US. Um, while in orange, we can see the global model performance um, outperforming all of these um, locally trained models. We then took, we, we then released the model um, and also took that uh, final global model to evaluate on an external test set 
from um, several hospitals where we achieved a 95% sensitivity and 88% um, specificity for predicting uh, the need for mechanical ventilation. So if you're interested, there's a nice video talking about um, this model uh, and the development. And uh, we also released the model on our NGC cloud. So finally, I would like to talk a little bit about um, some of the new FL uh, technology features that we developed at NVIDIA. Um, one aspect of federated learning, of course, is that um, the security that needs to be multi-layered. So we have authentication protocols that ensure that only participants who agree to work on a federated learning project can participate. Communication channels are secure using SSL. And then we have additional security measurements for like differential privacy to ensure that uh, no data is leaked while sending these model updates to the server or um, uh, cryptographic techniques like homomorphic encryption. And just uh, this earlier this week, actually, we announced that we open sourced our uh, SDK for doing federated learning. Uh, we, we call that NVIDIA Flare, um, federated learning application runtime environment. And it's uh, that's available on uh, GitHub. And uh, uh, it's a very permissible license. So you can use that for your development. And uh, we have a very extensible um, workflows and things like that implemented. So as I said, privacy preservation is a, is a, a, a focus of the framework, but also the extensibility for developing new kinds of federated learning uh, algorithms or schemas. So for example, we have uh, very extensible workflows that you can build on, on top of, or you can build, bring your own workflows like scatter gather, which is used for the, this uh, federated averaging algorithm. So sending the glo current global model to each particip participating side, receiving results back and updating the global model, or you could even uh, equally do like a, a cyclic training approach where to move models from one institute to the other to do like a continuous fine tuning of the model. Then we have administration and monitoring tools uh, and a, a set of APIs that you can use. And uh, this, like, uh, this, this SDK really comes from our experience in running these federated learning studies in the real world, like for the, the Nature Medicine paper. So um, all aspects of this federated learning can be addressed by using this SDK. Like you can, you could even build workflows for data preparation, let's say conversion of data to a, to a, a format that is needed for your AI model development or uh, data analytics um, that can be run in a federated session, uh, federated learning way. Um, authentication, the different workflows I, I talked about, and um, also the system is is uh, agnostic to the underlying training framework. So you can start, uh, you can use your PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow trainers to work with uh, NVFlare, um, and the monitoring and management tools like uh, Central TensorBoard visualization can be implemented by using our auxiliary APIs that um, provide additional communication channels with the server. And really we, uh, we target in different personas like FL researchers to use this toolkit to develop their new algorithms. We, have, we uh, would want to enable data scientists who can take their existing data science pipelines and apply them in a federated setting and uh, platform developers, you know, this is uh, industry grade um, code that can be deployed uh, in, in real products. 
So uh, another another big aspect of um, of doing federated learning is also to to use a a, a good deep learning framework and for for medical image um, processing or medical image analysis we we also developed a, a, a open source platform called monai this is a collaborative effort with uh, many academic institutes as well um, to to build customizable composable um, components that can be used in in uh, medical imaging deep learning uh, workflows. And as part of the Monai uh, project, we also have a federated learning uh, working group. So here we, we, we um, focus on building federated learning examples using Monai, um, um, reusable components and uh, standardization. So currently we, ha we have a survey so if you're interested in, in federated learning, uh, in, especially in medical imaging and healthcare applications, and you would like to uh, contribute to this community, then please uh, reach out to us and fill in also fill in the survey. And finally, I'd like to mention that uh, we also have a call for a special uh, issue in IEEE transactions of medical imaging on, on federated learning. And uh, please consider submitting your work to this uh, special issue. So with that, I, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, let me know if there are any questions. Well, thank you, Hogger, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so now it's the time for Q&A. Um, well, um, I have one question. So when you do the federated learning on the COVID data from many hospitals, there are data from different countries. So how to handle the um, non-IID problem here? Yeah, so in, in, that, in, in the, our study, we basically intentionally didn't apply any data harmonization techniques um, to, to really show how robust federated learning can be to, to diverse data sets and heterogeneous um, clients. But uh, I think the, the non-IID issue is an is a important um, research topic to uh, try to improve performance across clients that have uh, different data sets. So you, you can think of um, running federated learning outlier detection, for example, to make sure that your clients are um pre-processing their data in the in the right way or uh, uh, things like I, I i showed um learning these aggregation weights is actually a way of dealing with non-id uh settings where we might have to learn from the data in what way the these uh, heterogeneous updates should be uh, uh, combined in the best way yeah thank you so um, we have two questions from audience. Um, the first question about data heterogeneity, which you you, may, you already answered just now. Second question is about uh, the hardware requirements for each client. Well, it, it depends on what you like to do. Um, like in, in, in Reflare, for example, we don't have any requirements uh, on what, what type of hardware is running on the clients. Um, I can tell you for this this real world uh, study that we we did for Nature Medicine, we had clients you know running things in their local data center on a like DTX station, or uh, um, even on a local desktop machine, which has with one GPU. Um, some some clients would also use a cloud service uh, to to basically run their their training. So. If you do deep learning, then of course having a GPU is uh, on on site is very useful. But you could say think of uh, some data analytics tasks that might not even require uh, GPUs to to do federated learning. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions. Um, 
One question from Shiyang Wu asked, uh, um, uh, I'm curious about how did you encourage the hospital to join the FL project? As far as I know, the data access measurement of clinical centers are very strict. Right, so it's really about educating uh, the IRB, uh, you know, um, internal review boards um, at different hospitals about what federated learning is and uh, basically explaining that they can retain the governance of their data so uh, they don't have to share any data and um, explaining all the security measurements that we have built into our system. And then that way we were able to convince uh, sites to participate. But it is it did um, require a lot of you know communication, education, and uh, I think motivation. Uh, in this case, of course, we had a it was kind of early on in the pandemic, so we had people were motivated on trying to develop AI methods for dealing with uh, COVID. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the next question is that it seems that the overall higher performance of FL system from the uh, it's from the use of more data from different centers, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is really the, the key aspect that you know we know that AI models are uh, data hungry, and more diverse data sets result in more robust and generalizable models. And I think that's exactly what we saw in uh, these FL studies. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Adam P is for the, the scat gather approach. Do you need to wait for the slowest client to finish for each global update? Right, this is a, a good question. Um, typically, what we do is that we have a, a minimum number of clients uh, setting that is used to uh, move on to the next round. So as long as we have a, a certain set of uh, contributions from each from a, a minimum number of clients, then we can move on. But of course, it can result in some clients never contributing to the update if they're like really slow or have like a very slow uh, uh, internet connections, for example. So there is definitely work in uh, doing asynchronous uh, federated learning. So you could try to accept updates coming in from clients at any time. But uh, of course, that impacts your performance. Uh, so your con convergence and optimization procedure. So um, it's a, also a challenging top uh, topic at the moment. Uh, thank you. So the next question for Hogger is um, that as in the healthcare unit, we care about data privacy. How can I be convinced to use the data? In other words, is there any measure to ensure there is no sharing of data in any ways? Right. Um, the quantification of the data leakage, I think this is like a, also a very interesting issue um, at the moment. So we, we know of some attacks, you know, people are working on um, inverting training data from the, the updates that are being sent uh, to the server. Um, you could think that these inversion techniques are also useful to maybe quantify what kind of information is recoverable when when information is sent to the server. So we can use those as as, as a kind of insure, an insurance to uh, to uh, convince us that you know no uh, information is being leaked. And uh, typically, you can see that by adding things like differential privacy. So that's like adding some calibrated noise in a controlled way to the updates um, before they are being sent to the server. You can see that these inversion attacks typically perform less well. Um, on the same time, we have encryption uh, techniques like homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computation that uh, give guarantees about the data not being um, recoverable, right? So then the, any info in the homomorphic encryption example, for example, the clients encrypt the data before it's being sent to the server. And then uh, the server never decrypts the data, it only computes, um, it aggregates the uh, different contributions from clients in the encrypted space. 
and sends back a, a, a encrypted um, updated global model. And in that way, any information that is actually being shared is encrypted and uh, secure. Yeah, thank you. So another question is, how do you implement data standardization? Different centers have different formats. Right, so um, I, I think this is, uh, there, there, there is a need for tools um, that enable building these standards. So uh, ways of making sure that we have uh, pre-processing pipelines that can be applied to different sites. Of course, there's some, some standardization is needed. Um, like what we did uh, practically, you know, we, we, we wrote a, a tutorial on how to pre-process the data and uh, distributed it across uh, the different sites. And then uh, be, um, the data scientists at each hospital site were basically able to follow our uh, tutorial to prepare the data set. But as I said earlier, there's additional controls uh, very useful where you can do some, um, basically uh, sharing some summer, summary statistics of the data, for example, to detect um, outliers, um, which could indicate uh, that the data was wrongly pre-processed, for example, at a, at a hospital. Thank you. Our next question uh, is, do the slowest clients tend to have a higher alpha when you learn the alphas? Um, I think we, we didn't investigate this, this aspect. Um, like when training these aggregation rates, um, we, uh, we, we did use the minimum number of clients to correspond the total number of clients, right? So every client was always contributing. But yeah, that's an interesting question. We, we should uh, look into that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that's all the questions for Hoggers.